Selfish and Lovers Only. I'm your host, Joe Budden. And if I'm not mistaken, our very, very, very special guest is here. Our man of the hour is here. Adam22 is here, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And thank you for taking the time, Adam. How you doing? Joe Budden, how you living? I couldn't be better, man. Couldn't be better. Listen, I want to make, are you in a good spot of the house? I want to make sure your phone this serves is, more people than I've had in here in quite some time. Adam, I'll be honest with you. I don't pay any of the no jumper shenanigans any mind because I always think it's all contrived. Mm. I, always, I always say to myself, it's all fake. These guys are just doing what they got to do for the algorithm over there. But it appears that I'm wrong this time. Could you, could you, could you give me a cliff note version of everything that's going on and everything that has gone on? Like, catch me up to date. Okay, so, you know, the, the simplest way I could think to explain it would just be to say that, you know, we do the, the Tuesday show and about three years ago, AD came on and started to really make an impact on the channel, started to get a real fan base on there and stuff. And that was kind of like the first time that we really had somebody on the channel who ended up kind of taking on a life of their own, where like probably the first person we had who was like really popular with the audience besides me. And, uh, you know, so we started doing the podcast together on Tuesdays and then that branched out into him doing a podcast on Wednesdays as well, as well as like appearing on the news and just doing all kinds of different stuff for us. And, you know, I have been thinking for a couple months. So AD came in and was a star for the for the network yeah i mean like relatively speaking it was doing pretty well it, and it, it was you know very inspiring to us as a company who wanted to like build personalities because he they didn't love him at first and then within like a month or two they loved him and it was kind of you know that was like a really good thing for us to see because we didn't know that we could necessarily get people to care about somebody besides me right and so we've been doing the show for like three years and at a certain point over the past couple of months, I started to feel, and, you know, I, I was seeing it in the comments where people kind of felt like maybe me and him didn't necessarily have the same vibe or that the rapport wasn't really, like, improving or anything. So I started to slowly, like, hatch wait, this plan. Wait, 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 wait. Improving, yep. impro the word improving and says that something was wrong or needed to be improved upon. What what went wrong between you and AD from your perspective? I mean, it wasn't anything personal, like, between us. It was just the fact that, you know, I think my podcasting style has gone more towards wanting to talk about political stuff, wanting to have sort of intricate debates about stuff, whatever. And, like, you know, he's he's been very open about the fact that he typically is more just trying to have a good time and just trying to have fun. And like, you know, was, a lot of times, like I would be trying to really push for people to watch movies or documentaries or whatever. And, it, and, and you know, it was just, it kind of felt like I was just ramming my head into a wall because we just clearly weren't really on the same page anymore. Right. So I, I decided that I was going to have the conversation with him where I told him, I want you to stay on Wednesdays and keep doing, you know, the, the, he had a food show with this dude, Duno, who also was on the channel. And I basically said, I want to have you keep doing that stuff, but then I want to put somebody else on Tuesdays. Right. Which, you know, I, I thought it was like a reasonable compromise. What was that? You said that to AD. Yeah. So I said it to AD. And then the next day I hit up uh, Lush, who was one of the other dudes who was on the podcast. I and I Lush. told him about it. And, you know, Lush basically had like developed a relationship with a lot of uh, people in the Reddit and the Discord and stuff. Like, and I guess he was in some Discord call and he basically just ended up telling a bunch of fans what, what was going to happen before anybody knew about it besides me and AD. And so then AD ends up getting hit up by one of these people from the discord who basically told him that they all knew. And like, it was, it felt like AD was reading my text to Lush. Now I think Lush was just actually like quoting my text verbatim to AD or to people in his chat. And then it got back to AD. And so that took a situation that I thought was going to be able to be somewhat smooth 
in terms of like, you know, taking AD off one of the podcasts, but leaving him on the other and letting him continue to, you know, do stuff on the channel and everything. He ended up feeling pretty betrayed. Then what's the issue that Lush told the Discord if he already knew? What did you you say to Lush that was foul about AD? Okay, so the the one thing that was... Hold up, hold up. What? About your guy who was there for you during the pandemic and helped the network get to where it is today, and you gave him another show to break out star. Right. Like, what, how different was the message? It Lush? wasn't that different. That's the thing. It was like maybe slightly more harsh than what I had said to AD. But the one thing that I think. Well, tell me. That, yeah, the thing yeah, that stuck out to AD was a I'm little the cruel. Adam, listen, you could talk to me about this, right? Because I have fired people. <laughs> And I know. <laughs> in firing people, well, that's why some of this is, is pretty funny to me. Because when I went through my shit, man, did you cover it for the next two years. Boy, did you put a mic in front of anybody who had something to say about this. But in, in, when all that was happening, there was times I spoke to Rory about Maul and Maul about Rory. Right. So I'm, I'm trying to see, you must have said something really flagrant. Well, the one, because I, after this came up, I sent AD my entire conversation with Lush so that he could see every single thing I had ever said to him. And I think the one thing that he was annoyed by or that he felt was disrespectful is I said something about AD not being on the show meant that I wouldn't have to listen to the same four jokes over and over. So you felt like, so did you feel like they weren't or like AD wasn't improving or he was taking the, the Tuesday show for granted, or did you really just want to go in a different direction? Because those are two different things. Um, you know, I don't want to say he wasn't improving because, okay, all at the same time as this is going on, AD for like the last year or two, as well as T-Rell, uh, who was on the show for like the last few weeks before this and who's been on the Wednesday show forever, he... Um, they, they started their own platforms, right? Like their own YouTube channels, uh, community and back on fig, right? Not, and not signed to no jumper or not through no jumper. Why? Because I think like, I didn't know that anybody who was on the no jumper platform, like I hadn't anticipated that I would need to have people in contracts, making them exclusive or whatever. In fact, I, I encouraged AD to start streaming in the first place. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of thought that he was going to do more like gaming stuff or, uh, you know, I, th- I think I used academics as an example when it, when he first was going to start streaming. I'm like, you should just talk about like hip hop shit, but, you know, have your perspective. And I didn't really expect that that would end up kind of, you know, like I'm really proud of him. I just want to make that clear. Like these guys, the fact that they were able to build their own platforms off of it is like amazing to me. And like, I'm very proud of them and I'm proud of the fact that we had any involvement in it. But yeah, I mean, I, I didn't I didn't really anticipate all this shit that would happen in terms of us kind of feeling like we were competing. And I actually, I heard uh, Ak and AD talking yesterday, and AD even said that when they announced their live shows, because they, uh, they have some upcoming live shows, and it's like literally in the same venue as the No Jumper live show that we did around a year ago. And AD even admitted that like when they announced those live shows that he kind of kind of expected that at some point this was going to become an issue just because for us as a business to have them kind of doing like all the same things that we're doing i think that that there was probably a shelf life on that that doesn't make sense why not because if because if you're if you're a network and you bring people on and attempt to develop them then there shouldn't be a ceiling on that development like you're you're in content and they're in content, so naturally, well, it, naturally, it would have been, been the same thing, Joe. Wait, naturally, the people that come come behind are going to follow a blueprint. So why wouldn't they be doing shows? Why wouldn't some of those venues be the same? No, totally. But I mean, at a certain point, want to prop them up. No, that's what I'm asking. Definitely, but you know, it's like when when they're doing all the same stuff, but we're not participating on a business level. I, I, and you know, AD admitted this, which I thought wait, was kind wait, of wait, wait, but you know, wait, 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 wait. Acknowledge this dynamic, Adam. But you never wanted, but you never wanted to participate on a business level, or else their platforms wouldn't be wouldn't be separate from yours. No, and I realize that now because even just listening to T. Rail talk about it, I just kind of realized that, you know, I thought that I was going to put them on this Wednesday show, and that that was going to be enough for them. 
And I didn't realize how much more ambition they actually had. And, you know, now that like pretty quickly they were doing, you know, three nights a week, all of them were like streaming on their own platforms and stuff. So, you know, it just kind of got to the point where it felt like the focus on their channels, not only like made more sense for them, but also probably made more sense for no jumper as well. Unfortunately, it went down in this fucking crazy way where AD ended up feeling kind of betrayed because he had to find out about this, this discord call with lush, whatever I wanted to be able to, if we were going to separate, I wanted to try to be able to do it in like the most respectful and, and chill, calm way possible. And instead, of course, the most dramatic podcast in the world has the most dramatic breakup in the world. Adam, I know this is your white privilege jumping out, but you can't control their progress and control the detachment. You can't control the separation and control their progress. That's you can't do that. Yeah, I mean, in retrospect, I would have probably tried to like you know incubate those brands through No Jumper, and you know maybe we get a percentage of it, and we help. We like deliberately go out of our way to help them grow everything. I also don't know if that ever would have actually worked, you know, because they're very, very like t Rail and AD in particular, they're like mega independent minded, you know, it's like, it, it probably would have been a pretty serious challenge for them to have like grown these brands while kind of like operating under the no jumper umbrella. Like, honestly, I don't know. I don't know how well that would have worked. Well, well, don't, well, don't, don't speak for them now. That seems to be a challenge that they were more than up for. To do it under no jumper? To, to be with No Jump, yeah, I've listened, I've listened to every interview these guys have done this week, and they all, even in separation, speak like they had no problem being ambitious at No Jumper, and their views of where the network was headed and your views of where the network was headed is just two different in two different places. Can you speak to me about that? Can you speak to me about the pivot that you want to make with your content you said you want to be more political now no not like specifically it's just that in terms of the tuesday show specifically you know i was just i didn't feel like we had the best connection going at a certain point ad will tell you that when i had that conversation with him about replacing him on the tuesday show the first thing i said was i think that this will be better for our friendship and our business relationship in the long run adam now that it's been a few months, do you have a better understanding on the point that myself and the mess my co-hosts were trying to make to you when you were on our podcast? One of those points being about how white privilege allows for white people to come inside of hip hop culture, use it and milk it for every single penny they can, and at the drop of a dime, change direction and act like they want nothing to do with any of that nigger bullshit. Okay, but Joe, this is a this is a fake narrative because I interviewed four rappers yesterday. I interviewed like twelve rappers last week. Interviewing YouTubers the idea that- and porn stars and commentators on whatever. I mean, that's just I've always been dipping and dabbling in all kinds of different subcultures. Yes, it's different subcultures like YouTubers, SoundClouders, um, porn, right? But. How could you, how could you expect, I guess what I'm asking, how could you expect to not have any problems at your network, which is hip hop based for the most part, would you say? Well, at least the people you surrounded yourself with are hip hop based. And then you yeah, start, yeah. and then Richard Spencer. Um, can, you well, talk, can you talk I to me about the decision to bring Richard Spencer on your show? On your well, Tuesday show with no black people present. That's it wasn't on the Tuesday show, but it was. Uh, I arranged a debate, a debate between uh, Destiny, who's like a very popular left wing commentator, and uh, Richard Spencer. And you know, I really didn't think, like, in terms of the other hosts, I didn't think this would be an issue, primarily because of the fact that, I mean, AD had been the one who wanted to have us uh, interview Nick Fuentes, or we did like a debate, I guess, quote unquote. At a, at a certain point a couple months ago, but I guess he felt different about the Richard Spencer thing or whatever. And, and the other criticism I saw from uh, Van Lathan was just that the debate was a little bit too much of a debate, that we didn't really take time to dig into the creation of the alt-right and racist statements that Richard Spencer's made in the past and everything, because he his narrative that he's pushing now is that he's a changed man and he 
he doesn't, you know, harbor ill will towards whoever. And I mean, in the context of a debate, I didn't think it would be that controversial for us to platform. So Adam, I, I admire the business that you've built and I don't think any idiot could do it. Would you say that you've handled that one of the criticisms were that you handled uh, Richard Spencer with kid gloves? We, I, I definitely think the thing I should have done is I should have pulled back at a certain point and I should have tried to really zero in on any kind of negative statements about black people or anything, anything racist in general. Cause it, it seemed like we focus more on the like liberal conservative binary and less on the, you know, the perception of him or the, the reality of him having, you know, inspired a lot of hate over the years. So yes, you acknowledge that one of those criticisms are that you handled him uh, with kid gloves. Yeah, I mean, it should have been, it probably should have been more of an interview. I probably should have spent more time on, let's go over some of the major things that you've been associated with that are kind of ugly or very ugly. And uh, yeah, I probably, uh, I definitely failed to a certain extent by not spending more time on that, given my audience and how a lot of people in my audience probably would have wanted to hear more about all that. And by kid gloves, I mean, you handled him with a certain care. That's what I'm attempting to say. On my podcast, one of my criticisms of you was as a white man occupying space in the hip hop space, that you should probably handle more of these rappers and black people with care as you report on them. You don't, you don't, you don't see that parallel. No, I see it for sure. But it's also like when I'm interviewing a rapper, it it feels more. Do you not see how it would look away that you handle a known Nazi with more care than you do some of our greatest entertainers? Uh, well, number one, I, I kind of resent the idea that I'm like so insanely hard on most rappers because I interview rappers all the time where I avoid huge chunks of, uh, you know, controversial shit that I could be asking them just out of respect because I know they've talked about it on other platforms, etc. My my only thing I could say to defend the tone of the Richard Spencer debate was that he didn't say anything racist during the debate necessary, or at least I didn't really pick up on oh, anything. Wow, too That's awesome. Huh? That's awesome. Because that would have made, you know, in the context of a debate, it just didn't really feel like I should have gone through the greatest hits of like, these are the most messed up things you've ever done or whatever. I mean, you know, I I wish I had because it definitely would have helped to cushion some of the criticism we got from doing that interview. But also like from my perspective, doing content, like I want to push at the edges of what's considered acceptable. And Richard Spetch was somebody who's basically been blacklisted from the media for the last like six years or so. And the idea that I was going to get to put somebody who I consider probably one of the best minds on the left on camera with this guy. I mean, that was just that to me, that was like an incredible opportunity. And I, I tried to pay Van Lathan to be on the podcast with me. I tried to holler at a few different people, but generally speaking, nobody was really feeling it. Did anyone at your network uh, express their displeasure with that decision? And can you tell um, me? About- AD said something about it on uh, on his show. Yeah. What did he say? Just that he was disappointed in the the tone of it, basically. Okay, so I want to get back to Lush One because that was the first clip that I saw. Uh, thank you guys on YouTube Live, wherever you were. Uh, I saw you ask him to leave, and depending on how you feel, maybe y'all will work it out later. Uh, do you take accountability in in Lush sharing your personal messages with people, or do you still put the majority of that on the fact that he shared those messages? I mean, just like you said before, like if if there's a Joe Budden problem and this is one of the things i said to him right away i go you think when the joe budden podcast broke up you don't think that joe and parks had had conversations about what was going to happen quote unquote behind rory and mall's back i don't really feel like that was like as deceptive as it's being framed i was just talking to somebody who i thought i had a close friendship with who i thought 
had my back in terms of all this. And he not only lied to my face when I confronted him about it, but then he also, uh, you know, I mean, he did it in the first place. Like, you're sharing, like, insider shit with random fucking people that you don't even know on a, on a voice chat room. I mean, this is, this is crazy. I understand that. And from that, your decision was to fire him on air. I didn't fire him on air. I just told him to get out of the building on air. It sounded like a get out and don't come back unless I change my mind, but I won't change my mind type of thing. Mm, that might be fair. Yeah, that's how it that's how it sounded. All right, so what is the what is the chain of events from there? You you fire Lust. Is that the first person to uh, to to leave the company? Um I yeah, actually because well, I mean, yeah, basically, yeah. And then the the AD conversation, I think took place like the next day in terms of him formally saying that he was going to do his own thing and all that. Okay. So one and one staffer leaving, you can deal with. So you can deal with the exit of lush. Then AD comes and says, dog, I'm off it. I can't fuck with it no more. So that's two gone, right? Yeah. And like him, him and T-Rail and uh, Duno were all like kind of a package deal. And I always kind of knew that. That's one, two, three. So now that's four people gone, all in the drop of night. Did you? Did you? Uh, there's one more too. There's this other dude, Smack, that T. Rell does his show with, and I mean these guys were all kind of a a package deal. So I mean it was, yeah. Okay, and all right. So now that's five. So who else left? Well, you got to rewind it to like a month or two ago when uh, House Phone and. Uh, this other dude, Blasey, that he does, that he was doing a show with, they left as well. Why did House Phone and Blasey leave? Well, there's part of me that doesn't want to drag up the whole thing, but basically I interviewed a woman and she basically took that interview as an opportunity to expose uh, House Phone. And then I... Oh, wait a minute. Oh, Adam, you've been bugging for a second. I forgot all about that. Wait, you right. interviewed the transgender woman and she outed your man and, and you allowed that to happen on camera. Well, full full disclosure, I uh Holy. I instructed the editors to edit it out and one of the mentions of his name still made it in, and that was uh kind of the end of us doing anything on camera. Well, you know how many times I ask Parks or somebody to edit something out and they leave it in and the fans know exactly what I'm talking about. Wait, Adam, Adam, you have to. I, I don't hear enough accountability from you in this. You can't have a transgender come on your show and out your, your man. Well, I mean, I tried to edit it out, right? The editor fucked up. But yeah, I mean, I do take accountability because it's my fucking company. But, you know, this is the kind of thing that happens all the time. After over almost every podcast or like, at least half of the podcast, I'll say to the editor at the end, I'll say, hey, delete this one thing. Delete this awkward question. Delete this one thing that didn't sound right to me. And they always do it. And somehow this one was not so simple. Okay, you're just talking about the edit getting out. And I'm talking about just this being able to be recorded. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Well, Did for the record, have, I, I didn't know that there was any kind of history know, between them when I agreed that, to speak to her. You didn't know that she was going to come on and, and do that. No, and I mean, now now people try to say like that I knew because there was like a comment that she had left saying something about him on my Instagram. And I actually asked him right away afterwards and he just said, nah, like that she's lying. So I, I didn't, going into the interview, I didn't think that there was any truth to it, you know? Adam, what do you say to the to your coworkers that say you have been power tripping for quite some time? I've seen a few of them say that. One of them went as far as to say that one time you said, "Yo, I kind of feel like canceling all of these shows." <laughs> yeah. You, tell me more about this, Adam, and why you think that that was okay to say. <laughs> well, is that power tripping, or is that, if anything, by uh, canceling all the shows, that would probably be me like giving up power, right? No, no. I think the thing that made me uh, the thing that made me suggest just canceling all the shows altogether, which for the record, I said that during the house phone scandal, was just kind of like 
the realization that I was slowly starting to have at that point, which I think you might be able to relate to as well, that the whole network idea is a lot to bite off. The idea that you're just going to have all these different people doing podcasts on a network and that you're going to be able to build a business around it. I had a lot more faith in that idea a couple of years ago than I probably do now. So then what is your future view on your network and how will you go about running it then if you feel differently today? Well, I mean, I'm talking right now to the guy who inspired me to do a podcast where I just talk to the homies every week. So I feel like I also kind of look at what you've been through and I think a similar conclusion. I, I thought you were tripping when I first heard you say like that you didn't want to do a network anymore or that you, you know, having a bunch of sort of, you know, not random, but kind of random shows on your network that you weren't necessarily super involved with that you didn't necessarily see that being the future of the business you were running. I think in large part, it's just an issue of size. Like I think I would rather run a smaller media company that produces less content and is a little bit more focused than what like the last year or two of my life kind of turned into where it was just like a lot of headaches, a lot of drama. You know, we started to become like fodder for everybody in the fucking podcast community to talk about because there was so much shit playing out on camera. And I don't know. It's like, I, I kind of feel like now I would rather just have like a small crew of people that I could talk to and that work exclusively for no jumper rather than trying to, you know, like there were a lot of opportunities to bring even more shows on and at a certain point, I'm like, I don't even know that as a business, we're doing well enough to like be able to like monetize or, or really incubate like the shows that we have currently. So, I mean, yeah. I will not allow you content creators to jump back and forth on each side of the fence. One of my favorite things about this space is all you dudes that criticize me at every twist and turn of my journey, eventually, if you're successful enough, y'all will go through it too. Adam, the last few times we talked, you were telling me that you make all of the money in the universe. You were right. telling me that your bank account is higher than it's ever been in the world. And now you're sitting there telling me about how you weren't financially profitable. Well, I'm talking about one very specific part of the business, right? Uh, Adam. I don't know why you're talking like that, like I'm lying, but Joe, are there's a lot of different no there's a lot of different for? revenue streams. Some are very good, some are very much not as good, right? Dog, don't fucking bullshit me. Was no jumper profitable or not? And was it through the help of all the people that you had on board? Yeah, of course. No, but yeah, I mean I don't want to get too deep into our finances, but basically like <laughs> there were know. things that were working and there were things that weren't working. And to a certain extent, I just started to feel like the, the, the system we had going of like, Oh, let's just get a bunch of homies to be hanging out on camera every night on live stream. You know, it's, it's good for some people. It works for a lot of people, AD and T rel, they're doing great for it. But at a certain point with us, it just kind of didn't really seem like that was necessarily the future of where the business was going. Okay, so then what do you say to the people that say it just looks like you got a whole bunch of black people from the hood to help you during turbulent times and the second that everything was great and money was up and projections are high, you fucking wanted to kick everybody to the curb so you can pocket more of it for yourself? Well, I mean, they, 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 uh, they left. They chose to leave. Ah, uh, ha, 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 this guy, this guy. Yeah, they chose to leave. But initially, it, this started because you wanted to make changes. And I believe that words have power. And I think that your act, words are programming, it, even if it programs you. So I believe that your actions led to the exact result that you may have wanted. What do you say to that? I wouldn't say the exact result that I wanted because all I wanted to do was make some small incremental changes, you know, moving AD from one podcast to off and having him do the other stuff. That was what I was trying to accomplish and did not expect at all that it would turn into this, you know, atomic bomb of everybody piecing out. So who's on the network right now? Um, there's a bunch of people, you know, I've been doing, I did my podcast this week with uh, my, my boy court. 
and we have bootleg Kev uh, sub in. I'm not necessarily sure what we're going to be doing necessarily, but, you know, we still got Poetic Flacco, uh, Almighty Suspect, Gina Views, uh, Sharp. Um, there's more, too. They're going to kill me for not remembering everybody. But there's definitely, you know, uh, my boy uh, Icon. Uh, there's a few more. But we got a bunch of different people who are still doing stuff on the on the network. Oh, all right. So you didn't lose everybody. No, but I, you know, it would be fair to say that a large percentage of the most popular hosts have gone their own way. Well, why do you have all these other people on the network if you want to be a smaller based media company that that's a little more focused? Well, we still need, we still need people, right? We still got to have people. I, I still need people to talk to. We still need people to do the news and everything. We still got a, a bunch of people who are still excited about all this. Not if you don't want to run a network. If you don't want to run a network, then you don't, don't need any of those people. Okay, when I say network, I'm kind of talking about like the thing you tried to do where it's like, okay, let's create two podcasts that Joe Budden is not on on the same network and let's just see how it does. Right now, we have the news, which is kind of like a consistent uh, roundtable with different uh, personalities. And that, that's really like one of the things we have going that lets us try out different personalities, you know, and see how people mesh with each other. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would say that, you know, my ambition isn't to have, you know, eight podcasts on the network. I feel like that that would be a lot. Okay. I'm going to ask you something that... I've been trying to find an answer for all morning long, and I just can't come up with it. Mm -hmm. Why would you have someone on your show called the Perv Busters? <laughs> you got to ask Flacco that question. Flacco apparently was uh, doing an interview with them. But you were there. I approached the studio because I noticed that the uh, that the live stream that they were doing had been it had been stopped and immediately privated. And I thought that was really weird. So I went over to that side of the building and said, what the fuck's going on? And that's when the little confrontation that you saw on camera took place. Do you, do you think they plant that? Uh, yeah. Do you think they were hired, hired smear campaign people? Uh, I, would, I would doubt that. You know what bothered me about looking at that video? What? Is that you said to the perv buster people, you are spreading lies and you should do some research or do you do any research? Something to that effect. Do you remember saying that? Yeah, it's very, very true. That was the very same sentiment that I was expressing to you when I text you about a story that someone from your company was running about me that was false and a little bit of research would have showed how false it was and what you said to me in a very braggadocious i don't give a fuck type of manner was i i need to see something pretty pretty significant for me to take the story down and that being yeah. my problem with you content people y'all dish it in a way that y'all don't take it what do you say to this well, the first and most important thing I'd like to say is that the girl in question, I didn't even meet until she was 19. And I think this is a very important detail that I just want to really put out there. So, and I, I just, I, you know, let me flesh this out a little bit, is that we're talking about back in the day when I was, I think I was like 22, 21, 22. And I had met a girl on a message board at the time, right? And... Uh, it was like an old like punk message board, basically. And, um, you know, I knew other people that knew her and stuff. And so I thought that it was all good. We started chatting a little bit. We get on the phone. She lived in Canada, right? And so then she tells me once we hop on the phone that she's actually 16. And so my response to that, at, even at that time, even at 22, I did the right thing. Obviously, like getting on the phone in the first place is bad, but I, I did the right thing. I said, hey, I know this isn't that big a deal to you because it's legal where you're from, but it's a big deal where I'm from. So that's it. I didn't speak to her after that for like three and a half years. I was in a relationship for the vast majority of that time. And then I get out of that relationship and somehow me and that girl end up speaking again. Somehow. And then, 
somehow, I think I saw her on Facebook as like a recommended friend or something. And we sort of started speaking again. And then, you know, as serendipity would have it, I ended up having to go to this meeting with a, a company that I was doing business with at the time in Canada. So I asked her, can I stay with you? And she says, yes. So I go and I stay at her mom's house with her. At, she is 19 at this time. And I believe that that would have meant that I was 25. And after that, we dated for a couple months. And it didn't work out. Super short version. And so I really, you know, I resent this, this narrative that people love pushing, claiming that I slept with this girl when she was underage. It's just like 100% not true. I didn't even meet her. I didn't shake her hand until she was of age. So that's the most important thing I want to communicate to you in this whole thing is that this isn't a thing where this, this, this rumors out there about me and I'm embarrassed or whatever. No, it's like, it didn't happen. Like I did not meet this girl besides a brief phone call until she was of age. And I've, I've said this, I said this on academics stream in 2018. I said it on Vlad's uh, platform soon after that, but you know, it's, I feel like this is an important distinction because if you want to smear me as somebody who's just down to hook up with an underage person, it really doesn't hold up because I would hope that like anybody, if you somehow ended up in that position of being on the phone with somebody, which granted, this is, it's embarrassing that the phone call even happened in the first place, right? But I did not pursue anything after that. And this girl does not claim that I did. You know, if, if that was the case, it would have been probably reported in the media and everything, which it wasn't. The, the whole thing that leads people to believe that is that there's an old blog post where I talked about the, uh, the whole relationship with that girl. And I kind of like made a joke out of it at the time about the fact, and this is 2008 that I think I wrote about it. I made a joke about the fact that I, you know, had been pretty interested in her before I realized that she was underage, right? So that's where a lot of the jokes come from. But nobody ever includes the next paragraph where I say, but she was underage. So I immediately ceased communication with her, which to me is the probably one of the most important details in this, right? Did you call that serendipity? Well, the, the fact that I ended up in her exact city, uh, that seemed kind of, Kind of odd. Serendipity has probably too much of a positive context, but. Adam, <laughs> holy shit. Holy shit. Uh, well, it's just murder. <laughs> you have a publicist. I do. Okay. I went, they would have yeah. probably, they should have told me not to use the word serendipity. Well, Y'all should probably work on your response to this stuff. <laughs> you should not say the word serendipity, number one. That's no, fair, but I, I'm just telling you what happened. I mean, I, like what I just told you is exactly what happened. So I know, but I'm on, I want to unpack a little bit of this because I never knew that you fucked the girl. I thought this yeah, was we, I thought this was a girl that you spoke to who was 16 when you thought she was 19. You found out how old she was. And you disappeared and, and you got you got away from that because that can be very dangerous. Well, that, right? that is yeah, true. Wait, 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 wait. Let, me, let, me, let me talk. Let me talk. Okay. Especially dealing with a girl that young, number one, but they don't know shit about shit. They don't even know when they're putting somebody in danger, according to you. You said the girl was from wherever she was from, so she didn't know what she was doing, but you knew what you were doing. You said right. I knew what I was doing, so I got away from her. Well, right. you you didn't get away from her if by the grace of God she ends up back in your life while she's now of age. You're spending the night at her fucking mom's house. What type of white boy pervert shit are you what are you talking about? What what is the pervert shit about dating somebody once they are legal and of age? Because you know what it sounds like, and I'm not saying this is what it is. But I, Joe, I didn't, I didn't say a word to her for three and a half years in between that. You know, it's like we just sort of ended up you meeting. You waited for the girl. Me. You waited for the girl, Adam. Huh? You waited for the girl. I didn't wait for anything. We just ended up uh, reconnecting later on. 
How did you reconnect later on? Or the, the Facebook algorithm put the girl in your bed? You well, didn't know. You didn't, wait, you, didn't know, you didn't know at that point that you probably shouldn't fuck the girl that you were talking to while she was sixteen years old. So because I met her when she was underage, I shouldn't yes. have. Yes. Her when I was yes. Over it. yes. 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 <laughs> yes. That's what I'm saying to you. Well, in retrospect, I wish I had taken that advice. It would have made everything a lot simpler, right? Well, yeah, if you isolate that, right? But then they have the little nasty tweet floating around where you talking about fucking young girls. I had some, I mean, that, that, that seems like an exaggeration. I had some, some edgy, jokey tweets from like 2008 to 2012 or some shit that, you know, a lot of those are pretty fucking embarrassing in retrospect. I know you, Joe, I know that you remember Twitter back in the day and you know how fucking toxic it was. It was bad. Which is why yeah. I did a scrub of all the bad things that I had to say. But I'm not going to use the word edgy when talking about fucking little girls. I don't think that that's edgy. Well, I think that's probably not 100% accurate. Do you want to quote any particular tweet? I mean, I'm talking to you, so I don't want to pull up the tweet. But you know the tweet exists, and you know it's running around. Well, yeah, there's definitely some, some bad jokes from that era of my life, for sure. You don't still talk to this girl, do you? No, I haven't seen her since, I don't know, 2009, maybe. Are you aware that there are communities of uh, legal adult men who are into that type of shit? I mean, I don't know anything about that, but yeah, probably. Lord. Lord have mercy, Adam. You've got yourself into quite the conundrum this time, buddy. Is it really, though? This is the same shit from 2018. You know what's ill about this? This is not the same incident as the one that we spoke about privately, right? Uh, what did we talk about privately? That allegation. I don't want to say because... No, I'm this is that. This is that girl. Wait a second, buddy. No fucking way. Yeah, bro. Yo, you are a nut. Wait. Wait a second. So when did she say this? So you fucked the girl and then she said this when? So I fucked her in 2008 or whatever. And then 2018, I signed the deal with Atlantic. And that was the first time that I got to find out that she was going to say that I raped her uh, in 2008. So 10 years later, this accusation emerged from, from nowhere. And yeah. But not from nowhere, because the universe gave you plenty of times to have nothing to do with this underage girl when she was underage. Then she, then she got older. No, she, her, she she, I didn't meet her until she was of age. Let's just make that perfectly yeah, clear. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, but you were speaking to her. At, I spoke to her once before. And you had friends that referred this girl. Well, see, that's why I thought she was legal is because I knew other guys that had hung out with her at the time. And I thought that it was, uh, I thought that that was a good reference, but it turned out, no. You don't hear how that sounds like some kinky social club shit <laughs> i mean i know you're not like tuned into the punk world but i'm not there's a lot of uh, a lot of people sleeping with the same the same people i would say especially at that time yeah well don't bring punk world rules over to our good hip-hop conversation buddy don't you try it <laughs> well i mean it's probably the same in rap too that like the same the same chicks end up hanging out with like a lot of the same guys man Jesus, Mary and Joseph. Okay, so is there a correct... Let me ask you this. Let me pivot. Is there a, co a correct way to fire friends in the content space? Um, is there a correct way? I mean, I guess I would say just as gently as possible if in terms of friends would probably be the the advice that I would give if you, if you're interested in trying to preserve the friendship, because we all know, or, you know, especially that it's very tough to make an exit from working together and then still hold on to the, the friend thing. Right. 
I, I agree. I agree with that. Have you spoke? Have you spoken to any of the guys that left since since any of this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've had we've had some some very cordial conversations over the course of the past couple of days. So I'm not, you know, I really feel like probably I'm not trying to like immediately be all up in their shit or whatever. But I feel like there's probably a pretty good chance that we all hang out in the near future and that it doesn't really seem as big as it seems right now. It's not like. Like even with AD, you know, our conversation yesterday has just made it clear. He's like, I still think of you as a brother. I, I'll i never talk down on you. And I said, you know, yeah, I appreciate that because I don't think nothing occurred between us that was so, so big that we couldn't get past it. You know, I feel like, uh, if anything, you know, it just made more sense for them to do their own thing business-wise. And, you know, I wish them well, honestly. It's not... It's not something that I begrudge them for. I'm like, I'm actually really happy to see them doing their own thing. And even though I wish that I had been able to incubate it better, you know, yeah. I feel like I know a lot more now in terms of how I'll approach this kind of thing in the future. Got it. Got it. Do you, um, do you, do you have any of, of the people that left, running around saying that you stole from them or, or that you owe them any money? Did, did you, did you, were you able to dodge that bullet or no? No, that's, that's not even the case. Everybody who gets paid by us. I mean, now I see some of them kind of complaining about what they were getting paid, which, you know, from my perspective, it's like, realistically, I didn't know how much most of you were getting paid because I figured that if there was a problem, you would have said something. And then I find out after the fact that, some people had some resentment about what they were getting paid and I didn't even know. So, you know, that's, that's definitely part of the, part of the whole thing. But no, in terms of just not paying people at all, no, I haven't heard anything like that. Uh, did, what, were, were you paying well? I mean, there's a lot of rumors about what we were paying people and like almost everything is total bullshit. I've seen people talking about this guy gets paid six figures. I've seen people talking about this guy. I don't know. It's, it's, there's all kinds of crazy shit out there. I thought that I was paying people decently for, you know, realistically like being on camera. A lot of them was like being on camera a couple hours a week. So I felt oh, pretty yeah. all right. Bro, that's where it gets dangerous, buddy. Talking about minimalizing the job. Take it from me firsthand. But no, I'm, that's why I was asking you if you thought you paid well. It was a lot of rumors going around when I fired my old co-host. But one thing I was standing on was Everybody over here is paid well. I don't know what people are talking about. People are paid way more than what these companies say that these microphones on these podcasts should be making. So are you standing in that? Or in hindsight, do you see the areas where maybe it could have been a little better? I mean, my whole thing, and I know I don't know how popular this is, is if you want to raise you got to ask for a raise. I've had employees over the years who just kept asking for raises every year or two. And they kept getting raises every year or two because we, they were valuable to us enough that we needed them. Um, so I don't really understand how somebody could like complain about the pay if they weren't like trying to get paid more, you know? Mm, yeah. You said you spoke to these guys, any conversations about, uh, maybe bringing any of them back a closure, closure conversation. Um, well, AD did say that he would be happy to come back on the platform at some point if we wanted to have a conversation or whatever. So I'll probably take him up on that at some point. But in terms of doing consistent stuff on camera, I kind of feel like it's probably best that we have some kind of, you know, division between whatever they're building and whatever I've, I've built. All right. Tell me what you've learned from all of this. Or a few things that you've learned from all this. Well, I think the biggest thing is that you got to like lay down pretty strict boundaries early on in a relationship like this, I think, you know, and you can't just let it go wild. I feel like, you know, the whole drama um, element, you know, I, I kept seeing people refer to us as like the Jerry Springer of hip hop YouTube. And as much as you said that you thought that a lot of that shit was fake and scripted, I've never faked anything or scripted anything with these guys. I can't say that they've never scripted anything on their own because there's definitely been some like, you know, fake fights that weren't actually fights that happened on the channel a while back. But uh, no, nah, I've, I've never approached it like that. And I, I feel like, you know, where I'm at now, it kind of feels like 
you know, your, your first girlfriend when you're, when you're young versus once you've had 10 or 20 girlfriends, you're just going to know how to have a healthy relationship a lot better once you've got some experience under your belt, right? I would hope so. So, you know, I feel much more equipped to build something, like to build a cast of characters and everything. It sucks that I wasn't able to, you know, do it with these guys. But, you know, ultimately, yeah, like I, I feel like even listening to T-Rell talk about how he wanted to do everything under No Jumper, but then uh, he didn't really feel like we were offering enough or that we were like, you know, in terms of content, not money, but like he didn't feel like we were motivated enough to really build out like a full content slate with him. And, in, and I mean, I think he's probably got the most potential realistically. He's, he's, he's just been going crazy. The, the views on his back on fig uh, streams are crazy. And, you know, if I was to be in that exact, if I could turn the clock back a year right now, I would have definitely said like, okay, I recognize this, this motivation that this person has. And I want to, I want to jump in there and I want to fucking, you know, uh, embrace them as much as possible. Sometimes with me moving so fast and doing so many fucking interviews and everything, it's just, I don't know. I was, I didn't, I didn't have enough of my eye on the ball to realize what I had in that moment. And, you know, I, I, I can't like fully blame myself because that was such a new thing to me. And now I, I just feel like I have like a way better perspective on it. Mm. All right. All right, well, I hope you don't get yourself into too much trouble out here, young man. How much, how much more, how much, how much of No Jumpers content will you actually participate in from this point moving forward? Like, how much of the network do you have to put on your shoulders and carry right now? Because for a second, it looked like you were successfully segueing out of any of that. No, I mean, all the interviews and stuff have always been like, you know, 80 to 90% me. Sometimes I have the other guys co-hosts and everything. t Rail was doing a bunch of interviews for a while, but, and then the Tuesday show has always kind of been me uh, leading it for the most part. Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess like my main thing is that I think I realized that I'm not, you know, desperately trying to grow this thing. Like I want to do something solid and consistent that I'm happy with. And, you know, I don't necessarily feel like we need to have you know, five live shows a week or whatever. I feel like at this point, I'm perfectly happy to, uh, you know, slow it down a little bit and, and really try to focus on finding some more co-hosts that we, that we are happy with and just sort of keep building from there. I'm not trying to like compete with the view counts that we were doing six months ago or a year ago or whatever. Well, I think that is a perfect segue. I will now allow you the floor just in case you would like to apologize to Joe Budden for any of the network digs and jabs that you were taking over the years when I was losing all of my people and you were recruiting more and more. Well, so I think my main thing that I said at the time, and I guess you could just tell me if you agree with it. My main thing was... You could say, Joe, damn, I didn't even see all that shit you was going through. I didn't think that I too would be going through those things. It's a lot of adversity when you're trying to do some things. Sometimes you can have too much dip on your chip. Sometimes you could get caught feeling yourself. Sometimes you can confide in people and they could stab you in the back. They could share some other shit. Like, I, come on, you can do it. Joe, I totally empathize with your position and maybe I should have called and checked on you rather than interview anybody that had any dealings or interactions with you that had anything negative to say about you. Who are you even talking about, though, Marissa? Anybody. <laughs> anybody. You, 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 you saw you, the way you, I interviewed Rory you, Mall, you, right? You, you, anybody you, that has smelled a Joe Budden fart, you have had on your show. You, who? Marissa and then Rory and Ma. Marissa, Rory, Ma, Bridget, Mandy. I mean, you name them, anybody. Yeah, but did they talk shit you about did. you like that? No, oh, look at this guy. Look at this guy. Look at this guy. I've been friends with Mandy for years. How are you going to oh. act like me and you and her is all about you? Well, you were friends with that little 19-year-old for years, too. So your discernment in that area. In case you wanted to. Okay, Joe, I apologize. But also, I, I would like to... I want to emphasize my main criticism or my main take on it. I remember at the time was that I ended up feeling like Joe 
could have kept things going with his old co-host if you had just been a little bit more transparent and a little bit nicer. Do you think but that I, that's... I but, 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 but I didn't want to keep things going. The same way you don't want to keep things going. So you, you, you saw that. You, you didn't want that to work. It wasn't going to work, Adam. I knew that before any of that shit went public. I wanted to put my people on salary. They were offended by that. I didn't think they worked hard enough to be offended by that. And that was the end of the discussion for us. Whatever happened after that happened. That makes sense. Yeah. Like, I was relieved a little bit. Great. Now I can run my business the way I would like to run it. I'm asking, I'm asking you if you feel any sense of relief or burden off your shoulders now that your company is uh, running a little more like you wanted it to. I mean, you're, you're always going to have a sense of relief when you have like literally less, less work and less people to worry about. Right. But I didn't consider those guys a burden. I really like all those guys as people, you know, it's like, I, I, and I actually really like, you know, I, I, I value them as people and I want to work with them in the future in some way, but I don't want to talk about them like they were a burden because at the end of the day, I, I look at all those guys as very valuable. I'm, I'm sure there'll be other corporations that try to scoop them up, some of them, and do different things with them. You know, it's not, but in terms of it being a burden at some point, I mean, I, I guess that's fair. I guess I do have a little bit of a sense of, okay, now I can kind of start not not from scratch, but something closer to scratch. I think my final question for you today, Adam, is there anybody that, well, who are the people that you're sorry to, if any? I mean, yeah, I'm, I mean, I guess just in a general sense, I'm sorry to AD, T-Rail, do know all of them that I wasn't able to sort of, you know, maintain this uh, united front that we were pushing for a while. And, you know, I'll probably always regret it to some extent. I'm definitely sorry about that. But, and just really like the, the context in which they left where AD felt offended or felt disrespected, even though I know me and him don't see eye to eye because I'm, I'm sort of against this uh, Adam was talking shit behind my back narrative and whatever. But, you know, yeah. No house phone. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I forgot. I thought we were talking about just current times, but yeah, for sure, house phone as well. Adam, Adam, when when you had, when you get with your publicist privately, make sure they tell you that you have to at least sound apologetic during the apologies, and don't start it with I guess in general. <laughs> I'm just trying okay. to help. I'm just trying to help. <laughs> Any final yeah. words for me? Any questions for me? You got anything for me? You um, a little something for me. No, this guy, this he ain't got shit. This guy's world is rocking. Come on, give me something. Give me a little something. Give me what? Oh, all right, I'll take it. I, I thought you might add a little, a little question, question or two for me. But this is this is fine. You doing any porn scenes today? That's that's literally what I'm doing. Like before and after this phone call. Yeah. Oh my God! Wow. <laughs> that must be great. <laughs> Ruin these guys and then go fuck. <laughs> Holy shit. This guy's the man. Adam. I guess I have a question though. Like, what did what did you learn from doing the two girl focused podcasts on your channel that didn't really work out? Like, do you do you look at that now and think that was a pretty disastrous idea, or do you think that it, it could have worked? I don't think it was a disastrous idea at all. Actually, uh Bridget and Mandy were number two. In the hip hop podcast, currently as we speak on Apple, or at least they were two days ago. So that was a very successful podcast. That right, but they had to go elsewhere at some point, right? Do you think that like you trying to be the place where they started their podcast wasn't necessarily the best idea? No, I, I think it was the best idea. I didn't go about it the best way, but they started mm -hmm. with me, and then they grew to be somewhere else, and I still participate as a co-creator of the podcast. I just, I am not staffed well enough to be able to grow and be responsible for content creators, dreams and aspirations every step of the way. That's not, that, that wasn't ever my vision for me. Yeah, I feel that. But I don't think I want to be, uh, like you said, uh, an incubator. Yes. But keeping all of these shows with me for an eternity, that's just a lot of responsibility. 
Okay. Yeah. I like it. We should talk more off camera because I, I got deep in the weeds questions as well. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk off camera where you can really curse these guys out to me. Like I know you want to. I, I honestly, like if I was having the conversation with you off camera, I would continue to tell you how disappointed I was in Lush not being able to keep his fucking big mouth shut. But besides that, <laughs> I got that nothing against really, these guys. That one really irked you, but you're the one that ran your mouth to him. Yeah, I ran my mouth to somebody who I thought was a good friend that was going to be able to not go tell a Discord full of people. Yeah, but you thought the guy was a good friend and you were talking to him about somebody that thought they were a good friend to you. Right. Well, I mean, when you're when you're podcasting, it's business as well, right? You know, you're, you're strategizing who's who's going to work on what show, et cetera. You know, I thought I thought that was the kind of conversation I could have with him without him having to tell the world. No, no, it's true. I get it. Any. Uh, well, are you and Lush good now? Have you all talked since then? No. Oh, you don't want to talk to him. I mean, I think at that point, it's pretty clear. Like, OK, this is it's not the kind of person that I could really uh have any kind of relationship with. Yeah, you know, you ain't like that shit. All right. All right, Lush. Well, Adam's not talking to you, buddy. You're blue. <laughs> it's it's bad, bad. Right? It, feels, it feels great to, to look at someone else in the hot seat while you're not there. Like, it does feel good. I won't lie to you. Um, but of course, I hope you get through this, man. I do. I, I can't wait to see the direction of your platform. You're not interviewing the Nazi people anymore, are you? I mean, I feel like we interviewed the two biggest Nazis. I don't know where you really go from there. Not interviewed, but debated with. Well, something tells me you'll figure out exactly where to go from there. We'll make our own Nazi. We'll find some guy and just be like, hey, turn up. Oh, man. Adam, just thank you. Just kidding, Joe. Just kidding. Uh, no, it's fine. Uh, thank you, Adam. I appreciate you taking the time. Go enjoy your sex scene, buddy. Will do. I hope you're there for the next one. My man, I won't be there. You will. Appreciate you. All right, buddy. Holy shit. Holy shit. I don't even know what to say besides holy shit. Wow.